Uh, so this morning, the title of our message is Mission Minded Journey. So let's pray, and then we'll cover our text. We thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to study and to worship you through the study of your word. Lord, we ask that your spirit would fill us this morning and speak to us through your word. May we, these just not be words on a page, Lord God, but may they minister to us and cut deep to our heart to cut away the things that aren't of you, Lord, and to prune and to grow and to bear much fruit. That's our desire this morning. It's not out of religious obligation that we're here. We hope not, Lord, but may our hearts be open and receptive to your truth. May our lives not be clinging on to the, the things of this world, but rather be clinging on to you. And Lord, we just want to surrender this morning our lives, our week, our, our Sundays to you, Lord, and ask that you would be at the center of everything that we do, be the focus of who we are, Lord, and our mission in life, which we do have a mission. May we not neglect it. May we not ignore it in, in favor of worldly pursuits, but rather to lay everything at your feet, to be all that you've called us to be, things that we cannot do apart from you, apart from the study of your word, Lord God. We thank you that you've given us chapter and verse, 66 books to study and to dive into, Lord God, that we could apply these things to our lives and that we're not in the ocean without a compass, without navigation, Lord, but you're with us. You guide us. You're, you're, you're everything to us, Lord God. You keep us afloat and you give us the direction that we need, Lord. So I pray that we would move forward with that direction, with the plan that you have for our lives, Lord God, whatever that looks like. And may these Bible studies, these, these uh, worship, uh, moments of worship, moments of study, moments of, of reading your word, may they be uh, beneficial and a blessing in how we navigate this life. May they be something that we apply and anchor ourselves to, Lord God. And when we're uh, in, in the midst of trouble, when we're in the midst of a, of a heavy heart, Lord, may you lift us up this morning through your word and through your spirit. We love you, we thank you, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are in Acts, and I know, again, it's been a, a few weeks. So let's just take a breather and remind ourselves where we've been and where we're going. So Paul's mission was to go to Jerusalem, to return to Jerusalem with financial aid to help the poor believers that were there, the poor Christians, and to be a witness to the Jews that had yet to come to faith. But as you guys know, if you've been with us for a, a few weeks or a few months, you know that it, it didn't go over as well as he had hoped. So while Paul was there, he was wrongly accused of defiling the temple. A riot ensued, and then Paul was arrested. And while he is there in prison, it says in Acts 23, verse 11, The following night the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. So he's probably in this, this point of, of feeling quite down. I mean, the, his ministry is not going as well as he had hoped. He shares the gospel, and I'm sure you guys have shared the gospel at some point, and it just wasn't received. And thankfully, our responsibility is not to convert people. I mean, that's God's job. We're just ha handling the message, right? And we're delivering the message, uh, hopefully faithfully, as is described in the Word, uh, to the individual, and the results are with the Lord, and so too with Paul. And, and, but there is that temptation to feel like, oh man, if I had just said this, if I had done this, and just something was different, if I was different, maybe things would have gone better. And perhaps Paul was feeling that way, but the Lord encourages him. He says to take courage. He testified to the facts about Jesus in, in Jerusalem, and now he's going to do that in Rome. And so this is a prophecy, a personal prophecy that Paul is receiving. You, you did good in Jerusalem. I mean, people may not think so because they want to kill you, but you did good. And now he's on his way to Rome, which was Paul's desire. His desire was to go to Rome. So he's on trial, and he's on trial for two years as a prisoner, and he stands before Festus and Felix and Herod and 
Now he's on his way to Rome to stand before the emperor, Caesar. So while he and other prisoners are traveling to Rome by ship, they land on the Isle of Crete. Now it's probably late September, early October that this narrative is taking place. And Paul says, hey, maybe we should stop here for the season because the Mediterranean waters get quite <laughs> tempestuous uh, during, that, uh, during the fall and the winter. And they don't, they don't sail during these months until, until spring. But they want to keep sailing to a different part of the island of Crete. So we actually have a map for you of Paul's journey to Rome. So they're, on, they're at Fair Havens. They say, hey, we don't want to go to Fair ha- stay in Fair, ha- Fair Havens. We want to go to Phoenix. It's a nicer place. Uh, we want to port there instead. And so they just go 40 miles. They end up going 600 miles because a storm hits them and just tosses them around all across the Mediterranean Ocean. And they end up going in the direction of Rome but end up instead on an island we know as Malta. They strike a reef near the shore, and they have to swim to shore, and the people grabbing planks, and other people surfboarding, apparently, on the, the planks of the ship or whatever, and, but everyone gets to land safely, as was told by, uh, to Paul by an angel in the midst of the storm. So Malta, as we talked about a few weeks ago, Small island, 60 miles south of the island of Sicily, northwest of Africa. It's, it's this tiny little place. It's, it's smaller than, you know, it's, I don't know, small, <laughs> whatever. Okay? And there's like about 500,000 people on the island today. So it's not a very big uh, population on the island of Malta. And what's, what's, what I find significant in this passage is that you've got the greatness of Rome compared to the itty-bitty itty little Malta, which, you know, it, it, by comparison, it's like, yeah, of course, Rome is the destination for Paul, but God seems to have plans for Paul in Malta, which is what we're going to cover this morning in our text. So ministry here on the island is waiting for Paul, and it seems that God wants Paul to be in Malta just as much as he wants Paul to be in Rome. And we know Paul's desire is for Rome. Of course it was. It's the biggest, most influential city in the Roman Empire at that time. And yet, rather than God giving Paul a quick and easy trip to Rome, he allows Paul to go through the storm. He allows Paul to go through these difficulties. He allows Paul, uh, perhaps, to, to go through all these things for the express purpose of arriving in Malta to be a witness there. And I'm reminded of, of Jesus, who, who when, he, when it was time to go up north, he said, I must go through Samaria. Ooh, why? Samaria? Stockton? Why? Or whatever, whatever equivalent that we might come up with. Like, ooh, you know what? what? I apologize if you're from Stockton. I'm from L.A. I don't, it doesn't matter to me, so... But the places that we want to avoid, perhaps the places that seem insignificant, uh, the places that, you know, it just, no, I don't want to go there. Um, But to reach those who might otherwise be forgotten, that seems to be God's heart. Even if it's just for that one person, the scripture says that he leaves the 99 for the one. And even if that ministry was just for that one Samaritan woman, I mean, that would have been it. That would have been reason enough. So God wants Paul in Malta. Of course, yes, the big, the bombastic, the Roman, but even the tiny, the minuscule, God's heart is for those that don't know him. And if that's you this morning, I mean, you may feel insignificant in the grand scheme of things, of perhaps God's plan, and you read the Bible of all this these, these eschatological truths of, of world-shattering, world-ending prophecies and all these things going on, and yet God's heart is for you, the individual. He doesn't necessarily just want whole nations, and, but he looks at the heart of the person and whether or not they know him. And so when you stand before him, the great white throne judgment, you won't get to rely on your parents 
your church, your community, your nation, your identity of whatever that is, because that seems to be a hot topic, a point of debate these days, but what you did with Christ and his message of salvation, his gospel truth, his heart is for these people. And so as we approach this chapter, I want to cover these first six verses again. I know that we did it a few weeks ago, uh, but I, th I want to uh, cover uh, uh, some of the similar ground and hopefully uh, get some, something out of it. So in verse 1 of chapter 28, it says, After we were brought safely through, we then learned the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had been, begun to rain and was cold. So this is after they crash-landed and ended up on the island. And so it says in verse 3, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Now, if some of your translations, like the ESV, they capitalize the J in justice because this is probably uh, the equivalent of a Greek deity. Uh, there was a Greek deity named Justice. Uh, the, the Greek name was Daiki, and she would actually punish those that were wrongdoers. If they... If it seems like they got away, then Daiki would punish them at some later point. So they're operating according to this very pagan uh, understanding of judgment and justice. And so in verse 5 it says, He, however, shook off the creature into the fire, suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. So Luke is careful here to attribute this snake bite not to judgment, not to justice, not even to the devil. I mean, it could have been that. It could have been a number of things, but it just seems like Luke says, hey, it was the fire. The snake got hot. And they didn't like the burn, so it came out and bit Paul. Probably thought it was a snake, so they picked it up or whatever. And uh, it just... It just Stuff like that happens, and you know, it's our tendency to kind of just sometimes, if we're a little bit on the superstitious side, we over-spiritualize things like, oh, you know, this, this angels and demons are fighting, and you know, sometimes that is the case because we do live in a world where there's spiritual warfare. Don't forget that. But also, too, we mustn't forget that since the fall, snake bites happen. Since the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, storms happen, bad things happen, death happens. This is part of living in a fallen world. But that doesn't mean that, you know, calamity is, is, is a, a, a signal or a, a demonstration of God's judgment. That isn't always the case. Thankfully, God is able to use these things. So God uses difficulties in our lives. He uses the snake bites. He uses the things that we would consider calamity, disastrous, a difficult, or, or anything in between. And so the Lord is really, I think here, opening up the door for the Maltese to know who he is. Because this probably is an open door to ministering to Publius, which we'll read about in a bit, and eventually healing others on the island. So it's just an open door for the gospel, and the Lord is working and in, in, in moving in Paul's life. And They don't see it yet, and because they don't see it, they think that he's a god, which I know is weird, but oddly enough, it's not the first time that this has happened. <laughs> You guys remember in, earlier in the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas were ministering to people and they assumed them to be Hermes and Zeus. And so they tried to worship him and sacrifice to them. And this grieved Paul and, and, and Barn. And then uh, the people um, were convinced to, on the other side of the spectrum, oh, you know, let's stone them to death because the Jews came in and they started slandering them. And so it's just, people are so fickle. And their idols, they're, they're, they're so unstable in their, in their thinking in these, in these things. So, uh, but this is, this, Paul is not a god, it's just the Lord is with him, and he's going to be using him in the island of Malta. In Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, this is the, 
the very end of Mark, after the resurrection, and the Lord's speaking to the disciples, and he says this, These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So that's what we're watching here in the book of Acts. Now that we're in the last chapter, we've seen all of these things happen. I mean, pretty, for the most part, you know, the, the healing, the tongues, all the way in the, the day of Pentecost, and uh, a number of other instances of people laying on the hands and, and being healed from, from sickness and diseases. Now, this isn't an endorsement of snake handling. I mean, I didn't know about this growing up because <laughs> we didn't do this in my church, and hopefully you didn't do it in yours. But people handling snakes and thinking that this is a sign of, of salvation and spiritual maturity. That's not what, what Jesus is talking about. Jesus here is prophesying about the book of Acts. And yes, these things continue. I mean, the Lord continues to protect people supernaturally. and People continue to speak in tongues, and demons are continuing to be cast out. We don't believe that these things stopped with the book of Acts. The Spirit is still working and moving in miraculous ways. However, this is a prophetic description and not necessarily a prescription that, you know, hey, grab some snakes and see what happens. And that, that, then that's just, that's foolish. And I hope I don't have to tell you that. But that's just something that some people are into. Now, in the book of Acts, I mean, this, is a, uh, this is something that's, this text is covering decades uh, of, of uh, miracles and stuff. So it, we might be tempted to think that this stuff is happening back to back to back to back, and it, it, it doesn't happen that way. But the Lord does work and move uh, throughout the narrative, and it, it, so too throughout our own lives. And yeah, I mean, sometimes it's, it feels like, man, it's been a while since I've seen the miraculous. I mean, the miraculous stuff is happening every day, but uh, don't forget that the Lord is working oftentimes behind the scenes uh, rather than always parting Red Seas and whatnot. So in, in verse 7, 28, it says, Now in the neighborhood of that place where lands, were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hands on him, healed him. So as, as we go through this text, I want to ask ourselves a few questions about, about ministry and about the way the Lord works. And uh, we see Paul as he goes through he's, a whole lot of stuff and stuff that he can't predict. And he's, he's finding himself in, in circumstances that it's just like, wow, you know, suddenly I'm in, in the governor's house. So Publius, I love that name, by the way. Publius is, is so funny to me for some reason. Uh, it's a Roman name, though, and it actually means popular. So Publius was probably a, a man of importance. Luke refers to him as the chief man of the island, which indicates it's a very formal term. It doesn't sound very formal to us. It's a very formal term, and it indicates that he's probably the Roman governor of the island of Malta. And Luke's very accurate with his, his historical details. He uses accurate titles. He calls people by name, Felix and Festus. He's very important. He, or he, he considers the details very important, and he, and he brings those to light wherever it's applicable. So Publius, important man, his dad is sick with dysentery. So the Greek word for dysentery is dysenterio. That's, we get, that's where we get the word dysentery from. If you know what dysentery is, I I'm not going to describe it. You guys, you probably don't want me to describe it if you know what it is. Uh, it's a, it's, so, but the Greek word isn't specific. It could be a number of things. It doesn't necessarily equate to what our understanding is, but it's not good, whatever it is. Uh, for those of you that don't know, it's a disease of the bowels, to, to put it lightly, and it involves dehydration and blood loss and a number of other things. So in, in the ancient world, it's deadly. In modern medicine, medicine it's not as... as is fatal, but in the ancient world, it would have been even worse than it is these days. Another option is actually, it could have been Malta fever. So Malta fever is this parasitic infection in which it is contracted from the, the, the milk of Maltese goats. 
It could have been that. It's, it would have had the same uh, things. And that, that could have lasted months. Either one of these diseases, they would have lasted for either a minimum up to four months, up, up to several years before it was um, completely gone, if it didn't kill the person. So Paul lays hands, and we'll cover that in a bit, but in verse 9 it says, And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. So I want, want us to look at a couple of Greek words in these two verses. So in verse 8, the word for healing is iasato. It's different from the word you see in verse 9 that says cured. That's therapio. This word therapio in verse 9, it's a word used of medical treatments more often than miracles. Now, the language in no way rules out supernatural healing in this verse. It's probably likely that Paul was, you know, the Lord was using Paul to supernaturally heal uh, those that were on the island. It's also possible that Luke's skills as a physician were being put to use here. Just the, the choice of words is interesting here. If that's the case, then Paul's supernatural gifts and, and Luke's natural gifts are working together in tandem. And I think that's kind of neat to, 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 to realize that. It's not always the, um, like I said, the, the bombastic, but rather even the things that God has enabled you to do. Whether or not you're, if you're an artist, if you have a talent for, if you're a handyman, if you're uh, if you've got a particular hobby and you want to glorify the Lord in that, I mean, you're able to do so. As Luke was probably a very well-educated man, the Lord used him wide, like crazy in crazy amounts, I think, uh, as he has written most of the New Testament, at least in, in word count. All that to say, uh, our first point is this. Like I said, I want to ask ourselves a few questions as we cover this text. And the first is this. Do we see our circumstances as an opportunity? Do we see our circumstances as an opportunity to serve, to minister, to bless, to heal, whether it be iasato or therapeuo or, or whatever other word you want to use, whatever it is that the Lord is calling you to do, do we seize the opportunities that he's laying before us? Do we, when we hear someone sick, do we say, oh, I'll be praying for you, good luck with that. When Paul lays hands on him and, and you know, if it was dysentery as we understand it, the man would have been considered perhaps unclean. And it reminds me of, of Jesus laying hands on lepers, people that were unclean, but people that needed him the most. And he was willing to do that, willing to get, roll up his sleeves and get his hands uh, a, a little uh, dirty, so to speak. Are we willing to do the same? And I know personally when someone asks for prayer, I gotta pray on the spot. One, I might forget. <laughs> and two, I mean, there's power in prayer. We don't know what the Lord is gonna do, even there on the spot. Do we seize those opportunities? In Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, it says, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I mean, that's what we're doing here this morning, isn't it? I hope so. I mean, if you guys are just here just to hear me talk, ramble for 50 minutes, uh, I pray for you because that's, I mean, that's not even the scratching the surface. That's not what we're doing here. We're here for discipleship. We're here to grow. We're here to, to be laborers, to take this stuff and, and to have compassion on the harassed, on the helpless. As such were many of us harassed and helpless, and the Lord had compassion, saw us like pigs wall wallowing in our own filth, and takes us and makes us sons and daughters and, and cleans us up. And, 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 and so too, he wants us to be his hands and his feet in the ministry, in the laboring, in the harvest. 
There's a lot of work to be done, but are we willing to do it? Do we see the work and, and view it as an opportunity, or do we see it as like, oh, that's an inconvenience. Ooh, your dad's sick. Oh, that's, that's good for him. I don't want to talk to him. That's awkward. I don't want, like, how's the dysentery going? Like, no, uh, just I got better things to do. That's, I mean, that sounds awful. I mean, we can't imagine Paul talking in such a way, but that's oftentimes how we feel. That's how I, I feel a lot of times. Like, oh, I don't want to deal with that. That's too much of an inconvenience. Especially in our day and age where it seems that uh, culture and society is developing in such a way where it's like whatever is the most convenient is the most, um, the most uh, uh, desirable option. But to be inconvenienced for the sake of others, to sacrifice for the sake of others, I mean, that's what the Lord is calling us to do. And sometimes we might be caught up in our circumstances. Oh, I'm shipwrecked. I'm snake bit. I'm hungry. And this guy is sick, and I, you want me to do something about it? Well, yeah. Jesus And the disciples, they go up to Jesus, and, and uh, they say, uh, you know, these, these people, are, should we send them home? And they, they seem hungry. You feed them, <laughs> right? And, and it's like, well, they can't without his help, but that's the point, isn't it? That we rely on him, and we're not, we're not going in on our own strength. We're not going in on our own resources, because that's very limited. Right, when Jesus looks at the, uh, at the, at the, the lost, at the, the people and the, the crowds, he has compassion on them. And that hits home because there's days where I'm, I'm feeling very compassionate. There's days where I don't. There's days where I'm only having compassion on myself. And that's about the, 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 the extent of it. And, and what do I do? I mean, what do we do in those moments? We go to the Lord. Lord, fill me up. And I'm running a little bit dry. What is it, Spurgeon, that says that our our heart is like a cup with holes in the bottom? It sure is. And and we fill it up, and it kind of just starts to deplete and deplete, and that's a natural part of life, and that keeps us tethered to the vine. As Jesus says, apart from me, you can do do nothing. Abide in him. Abide in the vine. Then we're going to bear much fruit. Sometimes we think that we can get by on our own. It just doesn't work out. We just dry up and we wither. But if we abide in him, And sometimes I have to ask, Lord, give me compassion. Give me the heart that you want me to have. Because I'm not going to have it in my own natural, natural, uh, uh, with my own natural inclinations. I'm not going to produce that sort of thing. And so, too, again, perhaps Luke is using his own abilities as as a physician. Maybe not. Maybe so. Uh, It it is interesting, I mean, that he's even on this journey. He hasn't been throughout the, here, present throughout the, entire narrative uh, in, in Acts. But he's here, and I think it's for the purpose. And he's probably not making much of what he did, barely talks about what he did. But I don't doubt for a second that as a believer, the Lord is using Luke. He's not being boastful because he's talking about Paul and his journey and, and the way the Spirit's working. Those, he's got a priority uh, in, in these areas. But even so, maybe you think, you know, what what do I have to offer? I mean, you look at, and I'm reminded of this, this beautiful scene in which Jesus looks at this woman who's, who's tithing. She just drops a couple pennies in there. And he says, he looks at the disciples and he says, you know, she's given more than everyone, anyone else here because she's given everything that she's got. And so too with us. You may not have much to offer. I mean, look at the little boy with a couple of, you know, stale loaves and, and fish that probably smell really fishy. And yet Jesus takes that, and he multiplies that, and he blesses that. And so you may not feel like you have much to offer. You do. Because in the Lord's hands, it's way more than you'll be able to do on your own. He multiplies, and he blesses, and he grows. And, but that's if we give him what we have. And imagine if we give him everything, like the woman that gave everything that she has, a couple of pennies, I mean, it's not a giving contest. That's not what this is about, because if it was, she would have lost, because right? she didn't have much. But it's, it's, it's the extent of ourselves that we're willing to give, the 100%. Is that something that we can do? Is that something that we're, we're doing? And if we did, imagine what the Lord could do. Imagine what the Lord can do. I remember... It, I don't remember. I, I don't want to butcher this story, but I think it was D.L. Moody. 
who um, heard of a, of, a, of a preacher that said, imagine what the Lord can do in a man that, that, that gives him everything, 100%, just completely sold out for him. And Moody says, I want to be that guy. I want to be that man. And so he was this prolific evangelist in, in, in America. And so too, it's like with us, I mean, we can do that same thing. He's like, Lord, what can you do if I just gave you all of me? And stop stuffing stuff in the closet thinking that no one knows about it. No, you can fool other people. You can't fool the Lord. Open up the closet. Let him clean house. Let him dust and get in the crevices and the stuff, the top of the refrigerator that never gets cleaned. Let him, let him clean. Let him renovate. Let him replace the old run-down furniture and the old... The, and obviously, I'm using this as an analogy for the inside of the heart. I'm not talking about your house. <laughs> but the inside of the heart. Jesus knocks on the door, right? In, in, in Revelation. Whoever lets me in, I'm going to come in and dine with him. He's talking to believers. Is that us? Are we opening the door? Are we say, you know, Jesus, this is, this is Monday, or this is Saturday night, or this is not your time, this is my time, or me time. And then, and then uh, just, it's just a, it's this, this, this inconsistent life. I mean, no one wants to be divided. And, and you guys know what that feels like, I'm sure. This this feeling of division in your own heart. It, it's an ugly feeling, and it, it, it feels like you've you got to put on different masks for different people. This is my happy mask for the church people. This is my work mask where it's kind of like tolerant or whatever. Or this is my family mask. And, and, and the Lord says, take off the masks and to come before him in humility, in openness, in, in, in giving him everything that you are, to come as you are and let him transform you. Let him change you. You can't do it on your own. And so Paul is being used here, and he's healing. And we can talk a little bit about healing. We've, we've covered this topic a number of times because we see it a lot in the book of Acts. There's healing in the Bible, and sometimes there's not healing. And I want to bring that to it, our attention because in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul tells Timothy, take a little, take a little wine for your stomach. He had this, probably this chronic stomach pain. So he says, hey, Tim, take some wine for your tum-tum and, you know, don't just drink water, which is an interesting advice. I mean, it seems to be that, you know, Timothy wasn't healed of whatever this was. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul talks about Epaphroditus, who was ill nearly to death. And we don't read about any miraculous healings in Philippians chapter 2. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh that he definitely prayed for, but was still there. You can read about that in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. So there are instances in which there, is, there just isn't healing, but we still pray. We pray for healing knowing that God is able to heal. We have clear biblical examples to follow, and the reason why I bring this up is because sometimes we don't pray for healing because we're afraid that it's not going to happen or we are afraid that, or we don't believe that it's going to happen, or, or whatever else. Pray for healing. The scriptures say do pray for everything. You see biblical examples of the laying on of hands. And thankfully, the responsibility to heal is not ours, it's God's. Our responsibility is to pray, to pray for anything, everything and everything, and uh, to lay on hands and, and, and all these things. And um, to trust God with the results. Sharing the gospel, ministry, healing, all of these things that we think are for other people, for pastors or for Greg Laurie or some, someone else, anyone but me. It's, it's, it's our responsibility as well. And, and thankfully, our, the results aren't our responsibility. It's just the obedience part of that. So in this section... One of the things that we don't see is a sermon. We don't see evangelism. We, we see that Paul was, heal, or Paul was healing people, and the people were cured. We see that in, in verse 8 and verse 9. But Luke doesn't talk about the evangelism that follows these miracles. Does this mean that Paul healed people and didn't evangelize? Do you say, okay, you know, heal, all right, go home, have fun? Absolutely not. The assumption here is that during this three-month period on the island, 
These miracles open the door for Paul to share the gospel, of which the people of Malta still attribute their, their faith. If you go to Malta these days, you know, many of them are believers, and they, they thank Paul for that, that culture of, of faith that even uh, um, stood firm through uh, Islam sweeping, sweeping through the, the Mediterranean. I bring this up because Luke doesn't record all the details of a three-month ministry. He could probably write a whole book on that. Remember, the book of Acts covers decades. And it's just really, I mean, it's just a few pages. I mean, it's a long book, relatively speaking, but not that long. It's just a snippet. It's a little tiny little window of the things that we can see. And this is for a number of reasons, especially when you consider the limitations of first century literature. Okay, you couldn't go to Office Max and buy a ream of paper or a big notebook and just fill it up with your pencil. You couldn't do any of that. You could actually have to kill a whole flock of sheep to make a Bible in the ancient world. That's wild. That's why books were so expensive in the ancient world. So this is just a snippet of what happened. Probably there was a lot of evangelism there. And so I want us to remember that as we get near the, the tail end, end of the book of Acts. I mean, this is just little tiny pieces, and I can't wait to get to heaven and, and, and watch the movie, as a, as a friend of mine likes to say, or the, the video, or what he says. Uh, what does he say? Like, watch, we'll watch the video in heaven. I really hope that's true, because, man, that sounds exciting. I want to see how, how um, all these things that, didn't, that weren't described in the book of Acts, uh, and probably among those things is evangelism on the island of Malta. So in verse 10... It says, they honored us, they, they also honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board every, uh, whatever we needed. Um, so they leave Malta, and it just seems like they were blessed on their way out. That brings us to our second point. Do we leave a place better than, than how we found it? Do we leave a place better than how we found it? Matthew 5, verse uh, 16 says, Let your light so shine before, them, before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. One Bible scholar says this, Paul was no God, as they soon learn, but he was a messenger of the one true God with good news of life and wholeness in Jesus Christ and carrying out his God-given command. Paul gave of himself unstintingly to people. And do we do that same thing? Because again, in this, in this way that we live, in this culture that we live, where the information age is in our fingertips, I can order a hamburger and it'll be done before I'm done with this sermon. It'll be here in the church. Or I, I, can, I can do a number of things and, and, and it seems like my world is becoming more and more convenient to me. And it's easy to really just suck the life out of those around me and the people around me and the, the circumstances around me and to just look at life and think, what can I get out of this? What can I take? But Paul here is thinking, what can I leave behind? What kind of sweet fragrance of the gospel is going to be a remnant after I've left this place? And I know life is hard. I'm not trying to make you feel bad for whatever it is you might feel bad about it. Maybe the Spirit's speaking to you. I don't know. But and, and it's, it's these, these moments in life where sometimes it feels like you're just barely hanging on. You're just white-knuckling your way through the work, work week or whatever it is. But if you could just flip that perspective on its head and think, what can I leave behind? What am I leaving behind for those in my life, my family, my coworkers, my friends, my fellow believers at church? Is it solely about what I can take from the situation? Or, is, or is, am, I, am, leaving, am I leaving this place better than the way I found it? I think about the, the, the people here this morning that are such a blessing to me because I'm here throughout the week, and I see, oh, man, Monty did this, and then, you know, Jerry took care of that, and, and, and so-and-so, oh, you know, she cleaned this, and, oh, wow, I, I can look at that, like, wow. It's like, 
and, and it's another thing when, I mean, you have those people that, I'm not talking about you guys, of course, um, but instances in your life where it's just like, wow, that person came and they went and just like, it's like a tornado hit this, hit this room. And I'm not necessarily talking about cleanliness or whatever, but just what we do and what we leave behind. Do we leave behind uh, uh, a, a place better than the way we found it? People uh, more knowledgeable about the gospel. People with a deeper understanding of God's word. Or they're the opposite. So, uh, Something to keep in mind. Let's move forward in verse 11. It says, After three months we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. So the twin gods, this is, it, literally, it's Dioscuri. So that's Castor and Pollux, the these, these two sons of Zeus. This is Greek mythology. Uh, and they were regarded as the guardian deities of sailors. So they would put them on the ships, either in the front or the back, and they were to protect the ship from stuff. And this is a funny detail that Luke includes. I don't know why he brings this up, but it's almost as if to emphasize that even though these gods are prominent, these idols are put up on a pedestal, it's the God of the Bible that's protecting them. Right? Because these, these idols of, of, of even prominence in art and culture and you know, these things that are given much regard, they're insufficient to save from the storm. And so I think Luke is bringing that to our attention so it says, putting in at Syracuse in verse 12, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at uh, Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Puteoli. Sorry, I'm struggling with these. There we found brothers, and we invited to stay with them. And we're invited to stay with them uh, for seven days. And so we came to Rome, and the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage, and when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So three years prior to all of this happening, Paul wrote a letter to the Romans, to the Christians in Rome. So they knew about Paul, and they were excited to see him, so much that they were willing to walk over 40 miles to the Forum of Appius to meet Paul. And this, this imagery is almost as if they're greeting a, a king or an emperor. They would actually, when a king arrived, they would, people would greet him out of the city, out, outside of the city and or escort him into the city. So Paul's meeting them outside of Rome. But we see, these, as he takes these pit stops throughout the Mediterranean, Paul is hungry for fellowship. And he's meeting with the brothers and sisters in Christ. And so that brings us to our last point. Do we seek out fellowship? Do we seek out fellowship? In Romans 15, verses 29 through 32, Paul writes this. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers uh, to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. And I, I hope that as you come together with the saints in worship, that there's joy and refreshment. Not refreshments. <laughs> there's plenty of those. Uh, there's coffee, there's tea. Right, but to be refreshed. And sometimes I need that so much. Throughout the week, it's like, I cannot wait for Bible study, for, for Sunday, for meeting with the brothers and sisters in Christ, that we pray for one another, that we... That we lift each other, one another up and carry one another's burdens. And I like the way he says it in Romans chapter 1, in verse 11 through onward. It says, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. 
that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. That mutual encouragement. It's not a one-way street, but it's this beautiful two-way street of just this back-and-forth encouragement among each other. I pray for you, you pray for me. You know, we lift each other up, we remind each other of the goodness and the grace and the glory of God, that He is on the throne, and that no matter what happens in life, even though things get difficult and arduous and painful, God is still in control, and that our, our center is not on the things of this world, but on Christ. And the hope that we have is not in the things of this world, but in, the, 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 in His kingdom, uh, that is to say, in, in, uh, the, in heaven, um, but also in the, the kingdom that He's establishing here on earth, in the present, and even in the end times as we look forward uh, to the Lord working and moving and returning uh, again. And so we get to lift each other up when we lose perspective, when we need calibration, when we need reminders of His goodness and His grace, or if we just need someone to pray for us. I hope you have that network of believers, of friends, of people that are willing to uh, encourage you, and you, hopefully, are willing to encourage them as well. It's like, they could, he, Paul could have said, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to bless you. But Paul said, no, I want to be mutually encouraged. I want to be in, refreshed with you guys. And that's the desire, I hope, for all of us, is to be refreshed among uh, the saints. And so the, the book, or the section closes in verse 16. We came into Rome. Kind of almost anticlimactic. That There they are. So when Paul arrives in Rome... The Colosseum had not yet been built. The population of Rome was about 2 million people. Half of them, about half of them, are slaves. Many within the church are actually freed, freed slaves. They, they were slaves. In the, I mean, we, we look at the greatness and the glory of Rome, and it's almost this idealized thing, especially during the Renaissance period. People looked to Rome and thought it was just the best thing ever, but Rome operated and functioned on slave labor. It's just that's, how, that's how it was so powerful and so, such a, it was really, it was a, morally a monstrosity. And it's almost just, I mean, it, it is, it's divine that the gospel came at that time, that Jesus came at that time and revolutionized the world and changed the way that we think about ethics and, and life and, and, and um, the way we think about God and how we relate to Him. The veil was torn, and now we have open communication and relationship with the Lord. Philippians 1, verses 12 through 14 says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Paul's writing this while in prison. And he says, hey, gospel's going forth. The Lord's using this and encouraging people. And hey, even the Roman, the imperial guards, they know about Jesus because I'm telling them. Got a captive audience. We'll wrap things up with this, a quote for you guys. The Bible teacher says this, Life is a voyage. It has winds, angry seas, and crises we barely survive. The Lord helps us by trying to keep us out of danger, and he steps in when our own or others' choices are foolish or careless. The gift of calmness in the turbulent seas of life is given by the Lord who never panics. Why should he? He knows the outcome and the destination. The Lord's protecting Paul supernaturally, giving him peace through the storm, making him a witness among those who are sick and are in need of the gospel. And these things haven't stopped with the book of Acts. And so as we, the church, look at our lives and examine our lives, it's so easy because I'm a complainer. I complain about every little inconvenience. Oh, the the, the worst, woe is me. But do we look at life? through the lens of the gospel, through the lens of the goodness of God, the Lord is working. He's laying before us, sometimes low-hanging fruit. It's like the opportunities to minister are so available. He is so available. 
And it's so, it, we live in this, this life that thinks God is so distant and his work is so obscure, but if we would just dive in deep to the things that he has for us, the things that we'll, we'll see and, and the, the, the things that he'll accomplish if we just surrender our whole hearts to him, I think are just unparalleled par- parallel to anything we'll experience apart from him. And so our hope and our prayer is, is that we will be the church, that we will be continuing on as we journey in this life, that we would be mission-minded recognizing that the Lord is working even now. Amen? Let's pray.